thank you all for coming. I'm amazed to see so many people here. My goodness, there's Evan. I see a lot of very familiar faces. Uh, and so thank you all for coming. This is really nice. It's a little too much of me, uh, but <laughs> I can get over that. This was, uh, incidentally, my favorite uh, food recollections are my grandmother's uh, devil's food cake with black walnuts <clears throat> and Chicago pizza, <laughs> which you're never going to find in New England. <clears throat> and I have no idea who invented pizza with pineapple and ham on it, but uh, OK. <laughs> and so uh, this seemed like a really wonderful idea. And uh, then I found it kind of daunting. I thought, how do you really do this? This is, we're going to talk about food and language and what kind of language about food comes into our language every day. Uh, and so um, I did a little research. And uh, so this is what we're going to do. Um, I went through all the food starting with A, that uh, apple, OK? Wait a minute. Oh, gosh. It's not the Elks. OK. I started with apple, OK? Um, it, pe people will say, you're the apple of my eye. I want to go live in the big apple. Uh, or the, pick the apple on the tree of life. But apple is the symbol of love, joyousness, and knowledge. I thought you'd like to know that also. The next one I came across was cherry. Uh, as bearing flowers before its leaves, the cherry tree symbolizes man and woman born naked into the world without possessions, and as they also return to the earth. But cherry often means the word perfect, like the 1954 Cadillac Coupe de Ville was in cherry condition. <laughs> Got that? You know, you all have these words also, so if you want to tell me about how it came into your life and, and, and how you use it in some way, please do, you know. Uh, the next thing I came to was chestnut. Uh, it has a Christian symbol of virtue surrounded by thorns but untouched by them. But it's also a word often used to refer to an old joke or an old story. What a chestnut that was. <coughs> Corn. Corn is real interesting to me. Number one, it's the color yellow, which is the color of uh, energy. And it, uh, it, was, it was the thing that really brought the, the early settlers into this country through the first winter. Uh, but we use corn uh, to mean it's not funny, like a corny story, or it's too corny for me to appreciate. Um, and then I got to crab. As, uh, as cancer, it is the oblique retrograde movement of the sun after the summer solstice. But, you know, we all use it to denote, you know, what a cranky person this person is. He's such a crab. And so that's how we use that. From that, I went to date. Uh, we use it as a meeting or a tryst or a certain time of life, uh, a time to meet somebody at some point. But it is also the symbol of fertility and fecundity. So uh, to use it that way, uh, <clears throat> it really falls into place. Is this all making sense? <laughs> OK. Uh, and then I got to the egg. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's the cosmic egg symbolized by, by the sphere. It is the life principle. But you also use it to egg someone on, to urge someone. Or a person is a bad egg, not a nice person. Or you're caught in an error. I've got egg on my face. <clears throat> and then we come to goose. It is known as the breath or the wind, love, and the good housewife, calling a person a silly goose and, of course, goosing someone. Uh, you can all make up your own words to this point. I'm sure you know. Uh, grain, I got to the seed of life. Uh, we use it as a grain of truth. There wasn't a grain of truth to his story, so forth and so on. Uh, and then peach. Peach with the citron and the pomegranate is one of the three blessed fruits of, the, of Asia. It's often used to denote goodness, uh, terrific beauty. Isn't she a peach? Uh, it's a peachy idea. And so this is how I got to all of this stuff. Uh, and I got to the scallop shell. It's the feminine watery principle, the universal matrix. Um, do you all know the story how the Coquille Saint-Jacques got its name? You don't? Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> When you took, when you made the pilgrimage from Notre Dame to Santiago, <coughs> excuse me, in Portugal, you, to prove that you'd been there, you had to bring back uh, a scallop shell. 
but the word James in Portuguese is Tiago. In French, it's Jacques. And so when you brought it back to France, it was a coquille Saint Jacques. You brought the shell back from Saint James. And I think it was Escoffier who decided to, let's turn this into a dish. <clears throat> so that's the story on that. Uh, the other story I'd like to uh, also add is the macaroni. So, do you all know about macaroni? Well, in Naples, Italy, they never say pasta and they never say sauce. Anybody Italian here? Okay, stop me if I'm wrong. Uh, <laughs> and so the story that I heard and read about, this is a long time ago, was that uh, the Bishop of Naples, Italy, had gotten word from the Vatican that they were sending uh, a cardinal to, uh, to look at the church and to look at the people and so forth and so on. And so the Bishop of Naples was so excited, he said to the cooks, he said, you've got to fix something utterly amazing. The Cardinal is coming. And so they worked in the kitchen for several days and came up with this dish. And uh, the Cardinal sat down to eat and they set it in front of him and he looked at it and he clutched his heart and he said, oh, macaroni, <laughs> which in Italian and Latin means, oh, my dears, which sounds a little gay to me, but you know. <laughs> Okay, uh, it also brings us to strawberry, uh, which is the symbol of the righteous man, the fruit of good works, and when served with violets, it symbolizes the humility of pure righteousness. Uh, it's interesting that that would be that, because you know our, our restaurant was called Blue Strawberry, and uh, strawberries are also one of the vegetables, one of the, uh, the fruits that doesn't need to, uh, to mingle to procreate. It doesn't need a man and a woman, a male and a female, okay? Uh, we now come to Turkey. Turkey was once designated as it should be the bird of the United States. Thank goodness it wasn't. Um, <laughs> it lost out to the eagle. Uh, the word Turkey has become a slight put down for some people, not so slight for a lot of people. Uh, and then I got to stew. Stew often denotes confusion or musing. I stewed over it for hours. But in Yiddish, there is a thing called a tzimis. Do you know what tzimis? <coughs> it's a mix of a, a medley of vegetables, and uh, which also means, oi, what a tzimis this was, means that you got into a stew over something. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this thing with uh, food and words go to all different languages. Uh, marmalade, you all know the story about Marie de Medici and marmalade? hey, where you been? <laughs> when she lived at Chenonceau, which is this beautiful chateau over the Avon River, in, uh, in the Cher River in uh, France, um, she became ill. And uh, she called, they called in the doctors. This is Marie de Medici. And the doctors then went to the chefs and said, you must fix for her some oranges boiled down in sugar. This will be a great help for her cold. And so the chefs would talk about it, and they'd talk about Marie's malade. Uh, she has a malade, and so it became marmalade, that simple. Ah, uh, yeah, I know, it happens. <laughs> the word al dente was kind of never really popular in this country until the early 70s, when somebody on television talked about pasta being al dente, to the, to the, to the tooth, to the taste of the tooth. Uh, and so suddenly everything became al dente. Vegetables became al dente. This should be done al dente. I once, uh, when uh, nobody remembers Ginger St. John, I don't think. Anybody here remember her? God, we're getting old. <laughs> you remember Ginger? Also known as Jennifer? Yes, God, you're too young. She must have babysat you. She had a party one day and she said, oh, I'm having a housewarming party. And I said, oh, let me cook for it. And so I decided I would make uh, pasta, spaghetti. And so the spaghetti, I had just thrown it into water and a woman came up to me and she said, I, I want mine al dente. <laughs> I said, well, I'm gonna try to do that for everyone. She said, yes, but I really like mine al dente. I may take it a little early. And I said, well, don't take it too early or it'll be raw. <laughs> and so um, it cooked for maybe three minutes and she said, I want mine now. I said, okay, so I dragged it out and it wasn't quite limp and uh, threw it into you know, a thing and drained it off and put it onto a plate and poured the sauce over it. And about 10 minutes later, she came back and she put the, uh, the, the whole plate down next to the sink and she said, uh, the pasta wasn't well done enough. 
And I said, you wanted it al dente. She said, yes, but it wasn't done enough. And I thought, what more can I say to this woman? I'll put her in the pot. You know. <laughs> the other word that came up uh, in this country uh, was in the early 60s when Jacqueline Kennedy talked about doing a lunch. And uh, one of the things that she served was a quiche. And suddenly, within four days, every upscale restaurant in the country was serving quiche. So it became a whole thing in our language. Today, it's tapas. That's the new word that everybody is using. Everything is tapas. So it's real interesting to watch the food world and what comes up and what's new and what people start talking about. Uh, that brings us to meat and potatoes. It's an expression used to tell people that you were manly. I'm a meat and potatoes guy. It's also a slight put down to haute cuisine or anything like it, connecting what they might conceive as food for women or maybe even a little too gay. Uh, I, I was sitting, uh, getting ready to do, uh, this is years ago in Kittery, and there was a guy there we were going to do, um, uh, it was a judging for, um, for chowder. This is probably 1972, 73. And so I was sitting next to a guy who was an ex-Marine, and he was a selectman here in Kittery. And uh, we began to talk about, ah, he said, I'm really a meat and potatoes guy. And I said, did you ever eat at the blue store? He said, ah, no, man. I'm a real meat and potatoes guy. <laughs> and I thought, you know, that's what it is. It's meat and potatoes. It's just, you know, with a little something else on it. Yeah, I don't go for that kind of stuff. So <laughs> I'm sure it wasn't all that he didn't go for. Um, <laughs> And we briefly opened a restaurant in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, not briefly, we were there for about a year. It was, uh, it was real hard to do, this was 1976. You had to dress up in a suit and a tie to go and order your vegetables, because if you came dressed like this, they would give you garbage. It was, it was a real strange thing. And so opening day, uh, they came to interview us and said, uh, uh, tell me, Mr. Hallett, why did you choose collard greens and champagne for the oysters? I said, well, it sounded like the best of both worlds to me, and so I thought, why not, you know? And he, uh, he was just, he couldn't get over the collard green thing. I was also ter told never to serve rabbit in Memphis because that's, you know, black folks' food. And it was real strange. It was the first time that I saw racism in food. Uh, I think that's over with in the South now. Uh, I don't know, I've never gone back. <laughs> so, and... Uh, I'm sure that I will at some point. So uh, this, is, this is about what I have to say. Do you have any questions? Would you like to ask me anything at all? Come on, come on. Oh, thank goodness. Yes. So over your years, what do you feel is the most overused word in food, or words or phrases? Uh, Whether to critique food or in cookbooks or? You know, it's, uh, uh, they talk about everything being, uh, Artistic, but you know, made by hand. Um, thank you. That's you know, uh, I'm a little slow this morning, and I see that a lot. And I think, well, you're kind of overdoing it. It doesn't really mean anything anymore. But we do that in this country. <clears throat> we take a word and we overdo it, and then it doesn't mean anything at all anymore. Thank you for asking that. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. What's your favorite dish to cook? You know, I like cooking absolutely everything, but I think the thing that I probably enjoy cooking most of all is soup. I love to make soup. And I think that in all the years that I was at the Strawberry, that's, uh, and we had a lot of, you know, uh, a lot of people liked it, but I think the soup was it. I think once you start off with a soup, you got them, you know. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. If you weren't making your own soup, where would you get it around here? In New Hampshire or Maine? I make my own soup. <laughs> I mean, I've gone to restaurants and had wonderful soups, you know. Uh, Brendan is here. He makes a wonderful soup. Ha! Ah, Evan Hennessy is here. He makes a wonderful soup. His son makes a wonderful soup. <laughs> He's working on a recipe right now. Uh, uh, there are wonderful restaurants that I like to go to, but I don't buy soup. Uh, I make it. Uh, I, you know, I don't, I don't buy stuff. That's cheap. Yes, sir. What advice have you gotten over the years and that you would like to give to someone who's cooking in the beginning in terms of creativity? I think, uh, I think what, what I did was to, opening night, you have to understand, I had never cooked for more than six or eight people in my life. And suddenly there was 40 people, a whole house. 
uh, <clears throat> I wrote down all the things that I knew that I could cook well, and I took off from that. So if you start with something like, say, perhaps stuffed mushrooms, which in 1970 was a big deal, but that was only with breadcrumbs and some Parmesan, some oil and some basil and stuff. But if you took off from that and you started adding snails to them or added something else, I think that's what every chef should and probably does understand. You take what you know best of all and you just play with it. You just fuck around with it. <laughs> yes, way in the back, the good looking woman. Mrs. Shapiro, what is it? What's the difference between a chef and a cook? Well, a cook heats a pan up and puts a piece of something into it and they're cooking. A chef adds a glass of wine. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Yes, ma'am. Is there something that, no matter how it's prepared, fried, extra cheese, sauce, gravy, whatever, that you won't eat ever, no matter what? Eel. <laughs> Eel. I don't know why. I can eat snake. I've eaten snake. Eel. I just, uh, ugh. <laughs> you know, and I hear it's wonderful. You know, and all over France, you can get it cleaned and stripped down and looking beautiful. And I just, uh, no. Anybody else? Yes. I don't know. This is just coming to me right now. But um, I have three little girls. And, you know, as far as getting them to open their palates and um, what uh, one of them in particular is it's very picky. And um, I notice the way she just she's trying to describe how something tastes. And it's very different than um, what, what I think it tastes like or whatever. Um, how do you, uh, what, is it a real thing that, that someone um, like, can have um, interpret um, tastes of food that much differently than somebody else? Uh, do you ever, first, of all, first of all, you need to, you need to read Marcel Proust. Uh, <laughs> and you know, uh, I guess that there is, I guess everybody sees it differently. I mean, we're all different and I think we all have different tastes. And so to try to describe a taste is, is really difficult. And so how old is this little girl? Eight. Eight. Yeah. Do you fix separate menus for those kids? Well, not menus, but I fix supper. <laughs> <laughs> I can have like, the three things usually. Oh, uh, okay. No comment. Okay. <laughs> you know, I grew up at a time when that was it. You ate it, you know. And so, uh, you know, I have friends who have kids and they fix different food for them. I'm trying to understand how you would explain a taste. It's, that's a real hard thing to do. Uh, everybody has a different shot at it, and it is different to everyone. And if she's eight years old, she's got a wonderful imagination. And uh, tell her to write down, to write it down. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else, please? Yes. Who's your favorite food writer? Oh, Rachel Forrest, of course. <laughs> Goes without saying. Uh, I don't know. You know, uh, I I don't often read the food writers because uh, it's like movie reviewers. They've seen 40 million movies, and so their taste is very different from mine. I don't uh, mean reviewers, I mean like Ruth Reichel. Oh, she's wonderful. Yeah, she's real good. Yeah, and she good and uh, also, uh, what's his name, who did uh, Kitchen Confidential, who's got a wonderful job now. Uh, yeah, he's really wonderful. Boy, I'd like to have that job. Um, I'm still living in Maine. Um, I think those two, I'm trying to think what else. I have a lot of old books uh, of, that I find that, that, what's interesting to me is to read a, an old book where they talk about food. Uh, there's a book called Dunnybrook, uh, which is about Southborough, Maine, written by a woman named uh, Gladys Hasty Carroll, who is Ben Hasty's great aunt. Ben Hasty owns uh, Thistle Pig in Southborough, a, one, a wonderful little restaurant. And so in, in, in reading books, I often come across people talking about food. And I think that's really wonderful because a lot of people think, well, it's done and gone and passed. I think about all the food that I knew as a kid and what was available as I was a kid back in the 40s uh, and even the late 30s. <laughs> uh, am I here? I'm here. Uh, and I think the changes are amazing, amazing changes. 
I look at Portsmouth today and I think, geez, it's really remarkable. I mean, there are great chefs and guys doing wonderful stuff and not just there, but in Newmarket and in Dover, Dover, New Hampshire. I mean, <laughs> about time. <laughs> And so, you know, I see all of that and uh, I, I find that really kind of wonderful. I hope that answers your question. Yes. Anyone else, please? Yes, sir. What was one of your favorite food experiences, where and why? Geez, you know, the first thing that pops into my head is we were doing a, a catering. I catered uh, a couple of times. I hate it. Um, and uh, we were bringing food for the uh, SPNEA, the Society for the Preservation of New England Antiquities. And so it was early May and it was still chilly and uh, I had made a big pot of cream of uh, uh, a fiddlehead fern soup. <laughs> and uh, I thought, well, it's still cool in the kitchen. I don't have room in the refrigerator. This will be okay. So uh, I got up the next morning, we packed everything up and we got to the place we were going and I said to Esther, I said, uh, get the soup open and we'll heat it up and she opened them. She said, ah, oh, something wrong with the soup. I went over to look and I thought, ah, the soup is bad. And this is soup for about 75 people. So often as happens to me, it just plunks into your brain when you need something. You all know this happens when you need something. It just happens. So I said, you need to go to the supermarket, get me as many different colored peppers as you can and get me some melons. Get me like honeydew and maybe, maybe a cantaloupe or two. And then, and then I do what I always do. Wherever there's a refrigerator, I open the door and see what's in. Aha, uh -huh. oh, I'll use that. Uh, oh, here's a hot sauce. And so, you know, that's what I do. And so they came back and I made this soup and I said to the two guys working with me, cut this up like confetti. That was the peppers. They were beautiful, different colored, purple ones and green ones and orange and yellow and red. They were beautiful. And the melons were a green and a kind of a, you know, a cantaloupe color. And so uh, we heated, I made, a, I made like a, a chicken broth. Um, a chicken broth, somebody had something in the refrigerator and I added that and added some other stuff. And we put it into the cups, we put, we put all the, um, I'm making this a long story. Uh, we, put, we put the vegetables into the cups and then poured the hot chicken broth over it. And they took it out and there was an applause. And I thought, Jesus, I spent, two days making a cream of fiddlehead and it's gone and this took me 10 minutes and they're applauding it. So, and the other thing that stands out in my mind is uh, opening night at the strawberry. Um, I told you I'd never cooked for more than six, eight people and suddenly there were 40 people. I was having a wonderful time, I have to tell you. And, uh, and then I got to the salad and I thought, ah, where's my olive oil? Oh, we don't have olive oil? So I looked up and I said, oh, okay, what do I do next? And immediately it came into my brain, throw some ice into the blender and some cranberries and some mustard and some maple syrup and blend it up. And I did and what I got was a frothy salad dressing. It's the first time anybody, I think, certainly in Portsmouth ever ate a frothy frozen salad dressing. So. <laughs> That I remember I'll, I'll with some other stuff. Thank you for asking that. Yes, ma'am. Well, I found in a question. So I moved to Portsmouth when I was a teenager in the late 80s, and your book, cookbook was the first cookbook I ever owned. Ah. And I have to say, if you haven't read it, you should go find it because it's completely different in the style of writing and by being descriptive rather than simply do this and then do that, do this. It's a very, it's, it's a wonderful read, but as somebody who's a, a probably a bit of a rule follower, <laughs> it really affected my thinking moving forward on, on how to cook. Ah, so good. I really appreciate that, so it's lovely to be able to say thank you. Thank you, thank and you. I also always wondered why it's called the blue strawberry. Oh, God. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna be real straight and upfront with you, okay? It was 1969, and I had uh, left New York City for the summer and uh, uh, had a little house, a little schoolhouse uh, that was built in 1805. I was paying $25 a month for it. Uh, it had an outhouse with two holes so you could bring a friend, um, <laughs> if you had one. Uh, and uh, I, did, uh, I swam in the river behind the house to bathe. There was hot and cold running water, but no bathroom. 
Uh, it was a wonderful little place, and so uh, I would go to the beach once in a while. And so my friend Charles came in from New York City and said, oh, let's go to a gunpoint, okay? And he said, you know, I brought a little orange sunshine. I said, you did? Do you all know what that is? Yep. Look at that. <laughs> well, you know, thank you. <laughs> so we did, and uh, we're walking down the beach, and this incredibly wonderful looking guy came walking toward us. A young guy and blonde hair, and of course, you know, you're tripping and everything is glowing and, you know. <laughs> Thing. And as I was wearing a piece of lapis around my neck, and it had been given to me by a guru that I had been hanging out with in New York City, she said, if you wear this piece of lapis, your fear of good things happening to you will disappear. So I thought, well, that sounds cool. Since I'm nobody, I, it's a good, what a good idea. And so as he was walking by, this beautiful young blonde guy, he stopped and he said, excuse me, why do you wear a blue strawberry? And that was it. And so I guess, uh, according to destiny, at that moment I became a chef without even ever thinking. You know, I never thought I'd be a cook for a living. I mean, I loved to cook when I was a kid and cooked like crazy. And you know, as some of you may know, I used to do take Ann Page uh, angel food cake mixes and throw in some Kool-Aid of different colors, you know, do different stuff. My father said to me one time, can't you just leave stuff alone? <laughs> so. Anyway, that's, uh, that's how we got the Blue Strawberry name. And so when it came time to open it, we were picking out names and Mark turned and said, why don't we call it Blue Strawberry? And we thought, wow, okay. And, uh, and I should tell you, we were open about six weeks and it was a stormy uh, uh, winter uh, January, first week of January. A really bad night and we had reservations but everybody had canceled out and I was getting ready to close stuff up when there was a knock on the door and uh, we opened it and they said, are you a restaurant? We said, yes, we are. And they said, are you still serving? And he said, oh yeah, because you know, you needed the money. And so they came in and they sat down and uh, had, a, I guess, a wonderful dinner. They were really pleased and they said afterward, excuse us, but we have to tell you we're from Boston Magazine and we were up in, uh, 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 in Kir uh, not Kiri, but up north. Uh, where? Thank you. <laughs> Can you remember anything? A little bit. <laughs> and so they said, uh, we had not a good time and we're still looking for dinner and uh, your dinner was incredible. Can we bring in our cameras and we'd like to write about you. And so they did. And then about uh, three weeks later, Boston Magazine came out with a big headline on the cover for a great dinner in Boston, drive to Portsmouth, New Hampshire in the Blue Strawberry. <laughs> you know, talk about a kickoff, it was really nice. And we had Chinese people one night, and uh, <laughs> this is 1971. And as they were leaving, I said to uh, one of the guys, I said, gee, I wonder how the Chinese people like my cooking. I'm gonna ask them. And so I said, uh, excuse me, uh, tell me, how did you like my food? And the woman turned to me and she said, we're from Utah. <laughs> <laughs> thought, uh, so. Anybody else have a question? Yes. I'm curious what you've um, observed and learned about community. Community. Well, everybody's nice. Um, <laughs> I must say that when we went to open the strawberry, everybody was unbelievably helpful. From the liquor department, the, the licensing, everything. From, uh, from Concord all the way down, everybody was just amazing to help us open. It was. I walked in at one point and saw people I didn't recognize who were painting. And I thought, who is this? You know, it was really a wonderful time. And um, the mayor at the time, Eileen Foley, we invited her for opening night. You know, I was coming from New York City and I thought, the mayor is coming. This is like, cool. <laughs> and so, but she didn't come that night. She came early while we were, it was like 11 o'clock in the morning, uh, wearing a pair of penny loafers and uh, no socks and a Mouton lamb coat. Remember Mouton lamb? Mutton. And carrying a bottle of Great Western Champagne wrapped up in tin foil. And I thought, you know what? This is really great. Uh, so the town, in terms of a community in Portsmouth, uh, certainly in the 70s and the 80s and clear up to the 90s and now, it's wonderful, wonderful. I live in South Berwick and, you know, four of us. <laughs> yes. I'm just wondering, with a show of hands, how many people here 
ever had the experience of eating at the Blue Strawberry? Oh my gosh. Well, you'll have to come to dinner tonight at my house. <laughs> I'd like to know how many people would like him to republish the Blue Strawberry Cookbook. You know, that's really interesting. Um, we want to do that. I think we're going to do that. We'll see what happens. You know, it's really a good book. I don't know. Um, yeah, thank you. Greg Sissel said it was the best cookbook he ever read, and I was really impressed by that. Greg is a chef, and so, you know, you want to hear that once in a while. You have the greatest influence on me. <coughs> you and another uh, woman in Louisiana that I grew up watching her cook. Um, because you really, you, you invited creativity. Yeah, what I do. you were describing about how you made your soup, the night that I was at the Blue Strawberry, and I think it was after that article, um, you made uh, avocado dumplings that I, you know, <laughs> both my sisters and I had never forgotten that. And at the end of the dinner, we were dying to talk to you, and somebody asked you, well, how did you come up with, where'd you get this idea of avocado dumplings? And you said, well, I got to the restaurant this morning and all the avocados were in the windowsill and they were at their peak. And so you thought, well, what can I do with them? You know, they'll, they'll never, this is their shiny moment. And that's when you thought of making the avocado dumplings. And that's what I love. And your cookbook I've used over the years, whenever I get kind of in a slump and I'll get it out and I love the way you write, uh, because you'll say, or thanks. you could do this, or you could do that, <laughs> or, yeah. and you really invite that uh, attitude towards cooking of opening your refrigerator door, seeing what's in there, and not being afraid to just kind of let your imagination go. Yeah. And you probably had more successes than I, but <laughs> uh, sometimes I win, sometimes I lose. <laughs> it's a lot more fun cooking now. Ah, thank you. Yeah, it is. Uh, and I still am cooking that way. I'm still doing stuff like that and thinking, hey, it's just the two of us, and this well, is really I'm nice. Put it on your list to buy your new cookbook. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, is there a lot of people I want to give it to? Well, this one, you know, is not a cookbook, this new one. This is. Uh, this oh, is I know. The, uh, oh, okay. It's a memoir of I mean, all the kitchens. We well, want that too, yeah. huh? We want that too. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's, you know, you can get it at River Run. I didn't bring any along for that. Um, and the Blue Strawberry Cookbook, you can get it uh, in Amazon really inexpensively. Yeah, just look it up. Look up James Haller, and uh, I'm all over the place. JeffJamesHaller.com yeah. is his website. Yes, ma'am. time for one more question, James. Okay, that's it. So, you, cooking is inherently creative. Yes. That it is. And anyone who is creative or thinks they're creative gets stuck. So, for you in your world of cooking and food, if you get stuck, when you get stuck, what do you look to outside of the world of food to inspire you? Uh, I'm, I, if you look outside of the world of food, I'm just, I mean, what else informs your love of food and creativity of food outside of the world of food? I'd say probably music, you know, music a lot. Uh, or sunshine? What? <laughs> <laughs> Orange sunshine. Orange sunshine? <laughs> Not anymore, kid. <laughs> I'm pushing 80. No thanks. Because uh, I don't know what would happen again. Uh, you know, I could join Leary up there someplace. Uh, so uh, I, guess, I guess I'd say it was music, although the kids would say in the kitchen, can we turn on the radio? And I'd say no, that the, the cooking is the music and that's what you should listen to. Um, just... Just letting it fall into your head. It just, you know, it's just really a wonderful thing. And nothing is a failure. It either needs more salt or more sugar. <laughs> I guess this is the end. Thank you very much, everybody. Oh, you're nice. Oh, throw money. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you.